Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your people. Make us be people who carry your vision in our hearts for the sake of the world. God of heaven, by your mighty hand, build your church, strengthen your people, bring your kingdom to transform tomorrow and eternity. Welcome to the hills. To all of you in person at one of our campuses in North Richmond Hills, West Fort Worth or South Lake, and to all of you watching online, wherever you are today, you share this in common. You're all watching me on a screen. That's because my wife and I today are in San Diego. We are with Carlos and Gina Asazega. And they are church planters we support they launched Luminous City Church about two years ago, and I look forward to bringing you back next week a story about them and about other church plant efforts you are going to want to know about. Also, I'm going to start my sermon next week the way I'm going to start it today, with a story about heaven's favorite team, the Dallas Cowboys. I'm even wearing cowboy colors I have loved the Cowboys ever since I was a very small child. My love for them began even before I understood the game of football. And here's why. Because when I was a little boy, my father would take me to the Cotton Bowl to watch the, in the early years of the Dallas Cowboy franchise. And I saw these two men that I had great admiration for. Their young quarterback, Don Meredith, and their young coach, Tom Landry. Now, here's what you need to know about the early years of the Cowboys. They were terrible. Uh, they started in 1960 as a franchise, and back then the NFL didn't do things to make new teams competitive. The 1960 Dallas Cowboys were made up of players no other team wanted. And that first year, they lost every game, typically by a wide margin. But even then, you could see that Tom Landry knew how to build a future. It was the end of that first season, and they come out of the locker room. They sprint toward the bench before the start of their last game, and someone asked Coach, how did you get your team to be so inspired and fired up? He said, simple, I told them the last ones to get to the bench had to play. <laughs> so you could see that he had a vision for the future, and he was going to build it. Well, we're in a series called Build a Future. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know we have launched a five-year vision called Ask for Nations and Generations. And we're talking about the kind of church we're going to have to be to see these great things that we want to accomplish for the glory of God come to fruition. We're using the book of Nehemiah as a platform to study how to do that. Nehemiah was the son of a son of a son of a son of an exile. He was born in Persia. He had a good job as an assistant to the king. But when he heard that the walls of Jerusalem were down, he was burdened. And he set out because God gave him a vision to rebuild those walls. We saw in chapter one, the first thing you do when you want to build a future is you pray. And then Taylor did a magnificent job last week showing us that you build a future through faith. And what we're going to see in Nehemiah is the kind of leadership it takes to really reach a vision. The first thing leadership has to do is assess reality. You cannot fix a problem you won't admit. So we saw last time in chapter 2 when he got to Jerusalem, he got on his horse late at night, and he just went around and he assessed the situation. He assessed reality. And the second thing a leader must do, he must paint a picture of a desired future that is so compelling that people are willing to sacrifice to go in and pursue it. And so notice in chapter 2 what he says. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And we will no longer be in disgrace. And I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And what we're going to learn is that it is amazing what people can do when they have a heart to do it. 
The people accomplished in 52 days what they had not accomplished in 72 years. Together, they built a new future. And I'm going to argue it was because they built a new future together. We've seen that you build a future through prayer and through faith. And what I want us to see today is that you build a future through unity. I want us to talk about the relationship of vision to unity. And here's why that matters. God's purposes for our lives are too big to pursue or achieve by ourselves. Oh, that's worth saying again. God's purposes for our lives are too big to pursue or achieve by ourselves. So let's say it this way. You must build a team to build a future. I don't care how charismatic a politician is. He needs a competent campaign staff. I don't care how strong an arm a quarterback has. He needs a strong offensive line. I don't care how trained a soldier is. He needs a platoon to win a battle. This is why in the New Testament, every church that was started had a plurality of elders because a pastor needs pastors to build a church. You see, when God gives a vision to an individual, he gives that individual a community to pursue it with. God gave Moses a vision of an exodus. He gave David a vision of a temple. He gave Nehemiah a vision for a wall. But he gave nobody a vision to do it by themselves. They each had to build a team to build a future. You see this all throughout the Bible, but I'm going to suggest the greatest team builder of all is Jesus. Now, granted, no one could do what only Jesus could do, and that is be the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. Only Jesus could accomplish that mission. Only Jesus could offer his life for the sins of the world. But to take that message of his death and resurrection to the world, Jesus had to build a team. All the gospels showing him doing this in the first few chapters. You see in Matthew 4, he went up to several men and said, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once, they left their nets and followed him. Notice, Jesus painted a picture of a brand new future that was so compelling, they sacrificed to go and pursue it. We must do the same. And we must do it together. We must allow our church vision to bring unity to our community. And Nehemiah is going to show us how to do that. We're going to look at chapter 3 and then later at chapter 5 today. And I think you're going to be encouraged. And here's the first thing I want us to notice. That a vision that unites utilizes everyone's gifts and willingness. Now, I see just later you go and you read Nehemiah chapter 3. I'm not going to read it today, and here's why. It sounds like a Hebrew phone book. It's just one long list of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, built this part of the wall, and so-and-so, who was the son of so-and-so, who was the son of so-and-so, built that part of the wall. And all I would do is mispronounce name after name. But here's the big takeaway of that chapter, that the vision had room for everyone that wanted to participate. I counted 39 individual names of men that worked on that wall and 42 separate work crews. And what I found intriguing was the diversity of the workforce. It included priests. Now, what did priests know about construction work? Trust me, I don't. But they were out there working on the wall. It included merchants and city guards, and goldsmiths. Now, what's a goldsmith doing? Uh, If you need jewelry, that makes sense, but they were out on the wall. In fact, it even says there were perfume makers working on the wall. I have no clue if they knew what they were doing, but their part of the wall smelled better than anybody else's. And there was diversity, too, in that there were people in the town and people from other towns that worked on the wall. And one verse specifically mentions a man worked with his daughters. You have men, you have women, old and young. 
in town, out of town, all kinds of crafts and tradesmen, and they're all working together. There was work to do for everyone that had a heart to work. And the same is true for our church's vision. There's room for everyone to take a rooted course. There's room for everyone to serve in a ministry that blesses the next generation. There's room for everyone to be a part of our goal to see one person a day for five years come to Jesus Christ. Why does God take an entire chapter of his Bible and just list name after name after name? Well, maybe it's to make the point that God notices. That no act of service is too obscure to fail to get the attention of God. God notices workers. Now, I have to add this. God notices shirkers. I'm just going to show you one verse from that whole chapter, verse 5. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa. But their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. That's strange. They didn't try to stop the work, but they didn't take their place on the team. Oh, they were cool with a new wall. They wanted a better future. They just didn't want to help build it. And God noticed. God noticed every single person that pitched in to build a better future. And God noticed all those who said, oh, that's a great idea. You go do it, and I'll just watch. Oh, dear friend, I don't care where you are, online, any of our campuses. If you're a part of the Hills family, don't be a noble of Tekoa. Trust me, in five years, we are going to celebrate what God has done through our church. And you are going to cherish your memories of the part of the wall that you helped build. You see, a vision that unites has room for everyone's personal sacrifice. But it has no room for anyone's personal sacrifice agenda. And that's going to take us to chapter 5. You can turn there in your Bibles. We'll get there in just a moment. But have you noticed that most team fails are more a problem on the inside than a problem from the outside? More a result of personal ambition trumping organizational mission. Again, some sports metaphors. If you're an NBA fan, you remember in the early aughts, the Los Angeles Lakers won three NBA championships led by Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant, and they blew the whole team up because both players were concerned about the other getting too much glory. Let's talk about my Dallas Cowboys in the 1990s. Some of us remember when they won two Super Bowls in a row, but the head coach, Jimmy Johnson, and the owner, Jerry Jones, were jealous of the other getting credit, and they blew the thing up. Now, this isn't just a problem with sports teams. You've heard about rock bands that fall apart because the teammates squabble. You've heard about businesses that come apart because of the veiling of the leadership. You've, you've heard about academies having this problem. And, and I can tell you story after story about churches that come down, not because of pressure from the outside, but because of decay on the inside. Now that leads us to chapter five. And here's the context. Many of the people that came back had nothing. They were poor. And they had to start borrowing money from their fellow Jews who were rich. And they were charged interest, and some couldn't pay the payments. They had to sell their lands. They had to sell their homes. Some even had to sell themselves into slavery. Now, there's two big problems with this. Number one, the law of Moses expressly forbids this. Verses like Exodus 22 and Deuteronomy 23 make it clear. You can lend money to each other, but you do not charge your fellow Israelite interest. But Nehemiah knew there was a, also the problem that they were destroying team unity. 
that the greatest impediment to building that wall wasn't going to be the threat on the outside. It was going to be disunity on the inside. So notice now chapter 5, verse 9. What you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you're charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. And so Nehemiah aggressively steps in to stop a situation that was going to break up the team. But here's what I want you to especially see. His words had authority. They carried weight, not because of the authority of his position, but because of the integrity of his life. So now, starting in verse 14, let's keep reading. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came up to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. And in spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I've done for these people. And here's the second big principle we've learned. That a vision that unites emphasizes integrity and selflessness. That those who cast a godly vision lead with their life, not just with their lips. Okay, I want to show you a picture right now. The one man is named Samuel Pierport Langley. And he was very well known over 100 years ago. Educated at Harvard, worked at the Smithsonian. He was interested in men flying in machines. He was given $50,000 by the War Department, a huge sum at that time, to chase that dream. Everywhere he went, people wanted to see him. He loved it. Now, the other two guys, Wilbur and Orville, they ran a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. Nobody heard of them. Nobody cared, but they cared about a vision. And when they flew off of Kitty Hawk and Langley found out, he gave up the dream. You see, Langley wasn't in it so that he could teach people how to fly. He was in it to get famous and rich. He cared about his ambition, not about the vision. Now, Nehemiah, could have led with an entitled spirit. The people were used to it. The king in Persia would send different people to be governor for a season, and they always left richer than when they came. Nehemiah was different. People didn't see him dabbling in real estate, expanding his list of political connections, seeking the favor of the rich, trying to build his own personal empire. He didn't lead from above the people. He led from among the people. And he was able to build a team because the people knew that Nehemiah's vision was not about Nehemiah's ambition. Oh, church, we have got to unite around a vision that is powered by integrity and selflessness and not personal ambition. So I'm going to share an illustration now. I I pray to the Lord and I feel released to share it. So about 15 years ago, I started a nonprofit 501c3 called RAM, Rick Ashley Ministries. And here was the idea, that I would take my sermons, my intellectual content, and I'd put them on the internet for a couple of months. And after that, I'd take them down, and you could purchase them for a low price. And 
One dollar for every post or CD would go to this ministry, and I would use the money to help church planters and other missionaries. I kept all the records. I never took one dollar for my personal use. And over the course of 10 years, Jamie and I were able to give missionaries and church planters $150,000, and I loved it. Let me tell you, there is such joy in Radical generosity. But I shut it down a few years ago, and here's why. I started getting emails from people questioning my integrity. Why are you charging for your sermons? Why is it all about money? Well, it wasn't about money. I never took a single dollar. But I thought, if people write me and think my integrity is sullied, what are the people thinking that don't write me? And so I just shut down the whole uh, 5013. I just said, put everything up as long as you want for free. And I got to be honest, I miss the opportunity to give missionaries and church planners unexpected checks. But keeping my reputation unsullied is more important. I want to finish strong in my ministry. I don't want any of you, when I challenge us to sacrifice for this vision, to question my agenda. Like Nehemiah, I want to be able to say, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. And by the way, I've heard a few people say, I'm excited about Rick's vision. Please don't call it Rick's vision. Ask for nations and generations is God's vision. Given to the Hills Church for the sake of our city and the world. So when you pray for this vision, pray for all the pastors of our church that we will lead with integrity and with humility. Remember again, most team fails are not due to external opposition, but they are due to internal ambition and conflict. And so when we pray for the vision of our church, we must of necessity pray for the unity of our church. We must pray against, and it's about me, spirit. Because here's the last thing of vision that unites will do. It will recognize that blessing others is the win. You see, Nehemiah's real goal wasn't to build a wall. You say, wait a second, I read the book, he built the wall. No, that was his means to the end. Nehemiah knew that wall was down because the people weren't walking with God like they should. His real goal wasn't rebuilding a wall. His real goal was restoring the people. He prayed, remember me with favor, O God, for all I've done for these people, not for all I've done for this wall. The project wasn't the end. It was a means to the end to see a city revived around their allegiance to God. And so church, we're asking for nations and generations. And hear me, the goal of our vision is not to reach our goals. <laughs> the goal of our vision is to spread the love of Christ to people by pursuing our goals. We hope we raise up 25 families to foster, but the real goal is all the kids that are going to be given a chance to know God and walk in freedom and health because we raised up 25 families to foster. We're going to try to help 25 asylum families, but the goal isn't to reach the number. The goal is to let people experience the love of Christ that will change their family for generations. Whether it's the 2,000 that are going to bless kids or the 3,000 that are going to be rooted or the 1,825 that are going to get baptized, please understand the goal of the vision is to spread the love of Christ to people by pursuing our goals. And when we're on the same page about this, that blessing others is the win, then we will build the kind of team that can build a future. Now, let me show you this picture. This is a contemporary of Tom Landry. You football fans will recognize Vince Lombardi, one of maybe the greatest NFL coach of all time. Won a number of championships with the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. In fact, his name is on the Super Bowl trophy. 
And he was asked once by the famous car marker, Leah Akoka, what is the secret to team success? And his answer surprised Iacocca. This great coach said, most people think it's fundamentals, it's execution, it's talent, all that's important. But the most important thing is will the guy play for the guy next to him? You've got to build a team where the guy is thinking, if I don't make my block, the guy next to me is going to get his legs broke. And this tough, crusty old coach said, the key is love. Can you build a team where people really do love each other? Yes, to build a future, you've got to pray and you've got to have faith. But church, we must pursue unity Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. You see, unity is like a strong wall. Like a strong wall, unity protects. You can't sustain the vision if there's no unity in the community. By the way, it's one reason why the enemy keeps trying to break up the team. You read the book of Acts and the Satan found out early, if I try to pressure the church from the outside, all they do is grow stronger. So he tried to pressure the church from the inside. He tried to break up the team. Chapter 6, he worked on ethnic uh, diversity, Greek-speaking and Jewish-speaking widows. And the church stepped in immediately. They recognized the threat. They maintained their unity. And here's what it says in verse 7. So God's message continued to spread. And the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. When, when the people saw how hard and how well this church fought for unity, it helped them accomplish the mission. And so back to chapter 3, I was counting all these names in this long Hebrew phone book, and I kept seeing a phrase 20 times, next to him, next to them. You see, unity sustained their team. That work on the wall was hard, but everyone that worked on the wall was working next to somebody else that was working. For the next five years, we've got to maintain what can sustain us, the unity of the Spirit. There's going to be challenges. I promise you. The same challenges that have always been here at this church since I've been here over 30 years ago. The enemy will try to sow division in the church. I can already tell you what he will do. Well, all that church cares about is money. Well, of course, it's going to take a lot of money to pursue this vision. We've got a harvest offering coming up in November. Don't listen to that lie. We care about people. Or you're going to hear, oh, that preacher just has a big ego. He just wants people to think he's preaching at a big church. I'm already preaching at a big church. This is not my vision. This is our vision. This is God's vision. Don't listen to that light. I promise you're going to hear, because I've heard it for 30 years, every time I preach about race or justice or diversity or ethnic unity, well, I don't go to church to hear about politics. I don't either. But I do go to church to hear about Ephesians 2 and John 17 and Revelation chapter 7 and all the prophets say about justice and ethnic unity and racial reconciliation. And we will unapologetically pursue that because that is God's vision. And so church, let's keep the unity. You know, one way we're doing it right now is our prayer guide. I love it every day. I know when I pray through our vision prayer guide, that thousands of you are joining us and we're all on the same page praying for the same team. If you haven't started that, come join us. Let's all pray together. Like a strong wall, unity protects. But like a strong wall, unity must be built. Now, now Jesus purchased our unity on the cross, but the Holy Spirit told us to keep it. The Holy Spirit told us to maintain it, and it's hard. And here's why the work of unity is hard, because it's the work of the cross. It's the work of reconciliation. It's the work of dying to self. But we must do the work, because there is a future to build, and there is a world to save. Some of you have read the book, The Zookeeper's Wife. It was turned into a movie. It told about how there in the city of Warsaw, many people worked together to save 
thousands of Jews from the Nazis. And, and what you understand as you read the book is that it wasn't just a few people being brave. It took a team. It wasn't just the people that kept and hid Jews in their homes. It was the maids who didn't ask questions about why they suddenly had so much more laundry to do. It was the milkmen who didn't ask questions about why they had to start bringing so much more milk. Or the postmen who didn't wonder why more mail was coming. Or the delivery men who didn't wonder why they needed more groceries. It took thousands and thousands and thousands of people working together to save many. And Jesus knew that. And that's why the night before he died, he prayed this prayer over us. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. Church, together we can build a new future. If we build a new future together. Let's pray about that. So, Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I ask you, to bring this church in the next five years together in a spirit of oneness like we've never known in the history of this church. May our witness be convicting and may it be converting. And may many come to know Christ because they see in our church a kind of oneness that only the Holy Spirit can create. Give us all, God, a heart and a will to be a part of your vision for the sake of the world. And in the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen.